This is uh, Heidi Fern and Jose Rodal are going to talk about oil and oil car theory. Uh, we've written the categories on the right hand side, so this is the time distance problem, uh, theory, uh, and the physics. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to start talking regardless. <laughs> I'll just carry on. I I have students, so I don't care. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm used to it. Um, I'm going to talk about the theory of the Mach effect, a space drive. Um, uh, part one is going to be by by me, and uh, I'm going to talk about this weird conservation momentum problem that we have, since we're dealing with uh, an object and we want it to. Uh, conserve momentum and the momentum conservation is going to be from the rest of the matter in the universe and how on earth can something here be jiggling and how can we get conservation momentum from the distant matter in the universe. I'm going to try and explain that. I'm also going to try and explain that I really think that all this is, is buried inside general relativity. It's just that uh, it's, it's not easy. It, it, from the viewpoint of general relativity, it's actually quite difficult to, to see the effect. So I'm going to show it in a, different, a slightly different perspective, but then show it's really the same thing. So that's, that's my deal. Uh, so this is part one. I'm going I'm to finish around about 2.15, and then Jose Rodel is going to start from, the, the, force e uh, from the, um, the mass equation I've sort of scribbled out here. You'll see this during my talk. This is the infamous delta m equation that uh, Jim derives. I'm going to show you this derivation, but from a completely different viewpoint. I'll, I'll start with, so this is what Jim normally uses. Uh, this is what I'm going to derive here with some extra bits possibly, and uh, I'm going to show you where that comes from, from hoyle nolica theory. It's, it's literally directly from the field equations, and I'm going to do it slowly enough that you can actually see the derivation. In fact, one-on-one, -on -one, I don't mind sitting in the foyer with you, and I will go through the derivation, and I will show you exactly what I did to get exactly that result. So um, hopefully you'll be able to see it on the slides, but if not, I'll do it in person. So continuing on, um, like I said, I'm going to do the nitty-gritty mathematics, and, and Jose is going to talk about the force. Moving on. <laughs> That was quick, if you missed it, you know, you blinked. Um, oh, looks like I might, oh, I, I forgot to talk about this. So uh, yes, he's gonna talk about the force, yes, there's Yoda. Uh, this is the device, basically a stack of PZT crystals. This particular one has uh, two millimeter uh, uh, thick crystals. It's got an aluminum cap, it's got a brass mass, We've got this L-shaped bracket, uh, bought at great expense from Home Depot. Um, and this is, <laughs> we've got uh, 440 bolts, bolting the brass mass onto the L-plate and we've got uh, 256 volts that go all the way through the end cap and on the outside of the stack and into the brass mass. That's basically how it's arranged. This, this brass mass actually has a very, very small indentation so the stack can sit in there and not, not slide around. So uh, it's literally being clamped between the, the, the aluminum uh, end cap and the brass and it's not gonna move around because of that small indentation in the brass mass. Uh, this end cap also has a small indentation so it's not gonna be slithering around. So uh, this thing uh, we, we find does produce some kind of uh, force and it pushes in this direction toward the brass mass. Uh, this device here, this whole thing is inside a, a metal cage and the cage is also lined with mu metal. Uh, this cage, as you can see, is on this side uh, of, the, of the balance beam. Oh, that's much better, thank you. Uh, so here's the Faraday cage. On the other side, you see some weights here. They're simply there to balance the weight of, the of this, of this uh, Faraday cage with the device in it. So depending on the device, we have to change the masses here because it is quite sensitive to the mass. We want to make sure there's no, no up and down kind of teeter tottering kind of motion there. Um, the central column uh, is twisting on two C-flex bearings. And I've got a, a view slide next showing you the, those bearings. And down here, you see uh, coils and uh, that's how we actually calibrate the, the force. The force is, um, uh, we measure it using this uh, optical device here. It's a Filtech optical sensor. It basically has a laser beam point. It shines on a shiny surface, and we detect motion uh, very accurately. And uh, th we can put in a known force from the coils and then calibrate the distance measurement, and the distance measurement basically becomes our, our force measurement. Um, let me show you a close-up of this business. Heidi, what's the orientation? Does the cylinder weigh, oh, right. weigh down in there? This guy, oh, yeah, th this thing is either pointing directly outwards or it's pointing inwards. And what we can do is loosen a bolt here and literally just rotate this thing around so that it's either pointing out of the board or into the board. But the, uh, so the force reduction is perpendicular to that axis? Yes, yeah, we're not, measuring, we're not measuring a weight change or anything like that. We're actually measuring uh, this thing pushing on, on the beam. Oh, so it's actually physically moving forward like this. Uh, so it's actually going to sort of move like this, in and out of the board. Um, and this thing would measure a, a deflection amount. So the thrust um, direction is parallel to the axis. Yes, the yes. In fact, let me flip to the next slide, and it shows you a little bit more detail. Oh, I will go back. You said that um, 
you can actually loosen the bolt and turn it and then return I'm, I'm trying to go back. Right. It's not wanting to go back. You don't have to show it, but okay. oh, you can loosen the bolt, flip it 180. Yes. Exactly. So, Normally when I do that, I have to uh, take the wires off and then reconnect them. But yeah, it's just a little bolt. This whole thing just flips over right. and, and, uh, so and then it's reversed. Is, the, is, the, is this teeter-totter part of the balance sensitive enough to adjust to uh, for any, any new axial location? I knew you were going to ask me that. Core? Notice or? that this thing is bolted to the side wall. Yeah. So it's, it's still going to be bolted to the side wall yeah. when I flip it upside down. So it's not like it's going from the top to the bottom. Okay, That would be an issue. So if, if this thing was bolted, say, to the top, and I flipped it over, now it's bolted to the bottom, that would be no, an issue. But now it's bolted to the side, so it's always bolted to the side. Right, but you still can move the center of gravity by however much, by depending on how much torque you put on that bolt. Very small amount. Right. Very that's small amount, yes. The, that's the thing. Is it, yes. Is it, is it enough to, to where you have to rebalance it from a teeter-totter perspective? No. Okay. No. In fact, uh, what we do, I'm going to come to the procedure exactly how we do the measurement. So uh, let me flip again a little bit forward. Just, just, uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, Experimenter's question. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, Go sorry. ahead. Can you flip back one page, please? <laughs> this thing okay. will let me. It Can you like elaborate, me please, a little bit on uh, how this uh, coil calibration works? Okay. Um, everything else is switched off. Nothing is, is working other than the coil. We've put a current through the coils. Now I've got from a, from the base or from the balance part. This is this is the thing. It, it's going up here and it's going through the the. This, this is a channel, aluminum channel and it's going up, up through here, and there's Galastan contact. So basically, this is powered by the same power supply as the whole device. OK, so it's coming, the power's coming from the balance. Right, so right, right. So you power right. up the coil, and yes. it's acting against? And there's actually, there's actually three coils here. One of them is, is, uh, is fixed to the balance beam, and then the other two are actually fixed to the base. So the two outer ones are fixed to the base, and this other one is, is fixed. So, it, so the, the force is always in two directions. So you've got this one, this one pushing this way, and this one, this one being attractive. So it's like a double force, if you, if you think so of it. So you are also putting current through the coils that are on the base plate then, or it's not? It's a series connection. It's a series connection, series connection. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're measuring the deflection from the optical sensor, and that's our calibration. OK, because it's very close to the actual test article. And well, this one isn't being, this isn't being powered. In fact, if I, if I wanted to, I could put oh, a sure. dummy device with no, the no. same mass in there if I wanted to. I just to. mean, let's say it's, pow let's, let's say it's powered. Uh, okay. Then you could induce currents into the coil, and that could produce a force, right? Yeah, but it's not powered. That's the whole point. I'm only powering, I'm either powering this guy, or I'm powering that guy. Sure, but with the this induction, if you have, you have high frequencies, right, you could get a current in the coil. While testing the device. While but testing the device. While testing the device. That's why it's in a, it's in a Faraday cage with new metal. Uh, but you have connection cables going there. You have the Galinstein contacts, which are open. So it's not a completely shielded electrostatic yeah. thing. There's a thing in the book where it talks about removing OK, yeah, you we, did that. We can, you can take these completely okay. out. They're just bolted in there, and you can just completely remove okay. them. So well, it really makes absolutely no difference whether okay. they're in there or not. Good. And in principle, we could, we could wrap foil around there if we really wanted to, but that would mess up. So taking them out is easier. And, and Jim has done that already. I haven't personally done it, but Jim Jim's done that. OK. Yeah, speak to the experimental guy. He knows a lot sure. more about it than I was I just wondering, <laughs> because I saw how close it is that I was just worried. Right, about. right, right, right. OK, um, let me move on a little bit here. Um, those are the C-flex bearings. They're very simple, just two bits of metal that cross like that. And basically, they just flex. And you've got one on the bottom and one on the top. So one's up here, one's down here. And this beam is doing this kind of deal, top and bottom. Um, and you see there are Galistan constant. I don't know if you can see the little, me little me uh, metal contacts here. Uh, and there's a little Galistan uh, cup of plastic. And that's how we're delivering the power. So these huge power cables you're seeing, they're not weighting down on one side. We've literally got the thing uh, touching Galistan, so it's not all, that, all this heavy stuff here. Oops, what did I do? I think I just turned it off. <laughs> uh, so it's all that heavy uh, wiring stuff is not... Um, oh, I'll just do that again. Now. Oh, that's probably what happened. I occasionally put in blank slides so I get to talk to you. And I, I guess I'd forgotten I'd done that. Um, so that's the C-Flex bearings. Moving on. Jim, of course, is going to be talking more about the experiment uh, later on. Uh, oh, and here's, here's a typical coil deflection. So nothing is powered apart from the coils. And uh, you see, you, you, get, you can flip a switch and it goes up, and then it goes back to noise. You flip a switch and it goes down, and back to noise, and up, and back to noise. So I'm just showing you the sorts of things that you see with these uh, deflectors. And you can do many, many of these, of course, and take an average, and that's how we get a, a calibration from that. So the voltage, 
Why, yeah, this, why this is, is it voltage as opposed to... This is what we basically get from the... the, the oh, okay. uh, we're so measuring the voltage from that. That's directly exactly. correlated to so many... Exactly. And in, in some of the papers we've written how the voltage is, is related to uh, also the current, and then the current is related to the force, and we've got the force. We have a nice equation for that. Yes? Jeremiah, um, do you have a, a good reason why you have a trace that starts, looks like minus 0.1 and finally ends yeah, up as a neutral a little plus bit, so maybe, maybe I didn't do it at perfect, uh, at, at a, a low enough vacuum, possibly. I know, I've noticed when the vacuum is leaking in, sometimes these traces tend to go up slightly or down slightly. Uh, Jim, have you got a an, good answer for that one? There are several things that produce small circular drifts. One is when you first turn it along from single layers, you have your components and things like that heating up the electronics as well. Uh, the other is the air conditioning comes on in the afternoon oh, yeah. and That's starts it. cooling everything off. And then you get drifted in the opposite direction. Yeah. But it's a linear secular, secular drift. It's nothing on the time scale of what we're looking for. It doesn't look like a really long time scale, so I was asking because it seems like a fairly noticeable drift. And I was just kind of curious if you had looked at it. This is just this one, one run, of course. I can do multiple runs and take averages. Um, and, but I have noticed, though, that, that taking data in the night, uh, during the night when there's no one around and they don't have the air, they have the air conditioning switched off, it does vastly improve the, the noise that we, that we get. So uh, this was probably just run during the day uh, with a bunch of people next door doing experiments and dropping things and whatnot. So, um, so this noise level, you can really, it makes a big difference what time of day you do it, which is why I'm somewhat of a night owl and I spend my nights taking data. Um, anyway, moving on. This thing is really not liking me today. Thank you, it's just not, it's not happy. I don't really need a pointer anyway. Um, so the new things, next slide, that's just telling me that I'm gonna get into the experimental procedures and protocols. Next, uh, click again. Okay, so the device produces observable thrust when the uh, signal uh, is on frequency on a resonance specific to each device. So depending on the device, you're gonna get different resonant frequencies, go. Uh, standard data acquisition runs consist of five stages. It's gonna be a brief period of, of acqui acquiescence, so basically noise. And then we're gonna apply a pulse uh, on the resonant frequency. And then we're gonna sweep through frequency, maybe 15 kilohertz below the resonance frequency, through the resonance frequency, and then up to 15 kilohertz above. And that's just to actually main see if we're maintaining the, the resonant frequency. As this device heats up, it can actually change frequency a little bit. And if you, if you see the thrust big in, in the, right in the center of that sweep, you know that you're still on resonance. Or it may go slightly up or slightly down, and then you can tune it. We're tuning it by hand right now. Frequency of the voltage? Of the, the, AC, power of power. the AC that we're sending to the device, yeah. Um, so, the, so we sweep above and below, and then there's a, a third, a, so pulse, sweep, and then a second pulse on resonance. Um, and then the final period of, of uh, no, no power, so you get again uh, the noise. Next. Uh, so we monitor, monitor several variables, we monitor the, monitor the thrust, uh, the voltage across the device, and the accelerometer, which is actually a PZT, which is not being powered, which is embedded in the, in the stack. Um, whether or not that's a great idea, I'm not sure, but uh, we do have it there and we can monitor how the stack is, is moving. So one of them isn't powered and we're taking the voltage from that and that's giving us an idea of how, how the stack is moving. We've also got temperature at both ends. So sometimes we'll put a, quite often we put uh, th thermistors both in the aluminum cap, sort of embedded and also embedded in the brass mass and we can take both of those. So we can get the temperature of the brass and the aluminum and, and compare the two, hopefully to get uh, an idea at least of what's happening with the uh, PZT. Because if you overheat it, you can, you can fry these things and then you're not getting anything. Next. Um, so we ran, uh, we ran the, the, the thruster in, in one direction and then we would reverse it and run in the opposite direction. And the usual procedure would be to, to average the forward, average the reverse, and then subtract the two. So that any, anything that doesn't reverse is some kind of weird noise that we want to get rid of. So forward minus the reverse, and that gives you a good, uh, a good average uh, value of the, of the thrust or the force that we see from this thing. So, so by, that, by doing that, you're subtracting the non-reversing uh, non spurious kind of signal noise. Next. And here's a typical one from a while ago. I'm just telling you, this is old data, by the way. Uh, I just wanted to show you a typical thing. So here you see it's averaged over about 12 runs. Noise, noise, noise. Here's the pulse that goes on. See, there's a, there's a big effect. There's a, the, the, the thrust of that seems to go down and flies up. And then, then you have a steady thrust. And then when you switch off, 
opposite direction and then goes back to, to the, the noise level again. So that's a typical thing that we've been doing, for, for Jim's been doing now for many years, and, uh, and this shows a, a continuous level of uh, sort of almost steady thrust for a, a few seconds. And it looks like this transient that goes on the switch on and switch off, they're in opposite directions, so at that point we could, it, it wasn't very useful. But you do notice it, it does seem to be somewhat larger than the actual thrust level, the steady thrust level that we have. So, so it was interesting to look at those transients. So you know, it comes down and it spikes up. Right. What, what is, what's the damping mechanism that keeps it from just going up? Is it the flex? Is it the flexure in the bearings that kind of is meeting that? Well, partly, it's partly. Kind of, you know, but it, it, it could be. <coughs> there is a magnetic damper in there. But there could be something else happening as well, and Jose is going to talk about the model, and he has another explanation for it. Okay. Um, so let's let's leave that for Jose. But Next, is expected, or is that it, it is expected in the theory, yes. In the theory, yes. Right? It goes up and stops. No, what's expected is a transient, yeah. and then a steady thrust, okay. and the small amount of roller shoulders because of the anchoring is critical. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, this was a. a um, and no, what? Skip it. I'm not even going to bother about that one. Next one. Um, here are some other devices. That was a PMN device that didn't really work very well. So I just want to show you that we have tried things that didn't work. Uh, we've tried using bigger stacks with small aluminum on both sides and uh, brass on one side, aluminum that side with great big, dirty, great big bolt through the middle. That was really bad. Uh, and there's the design in, in, in the, the PMN that just simply didn't work very well. We've also tried equal masses and then actually supporting this thing in the middle so that there's no bias as to front or back. And when you do that, you actually get a null result. In fact, the theory also explains that, that it's going to, you're going to get a null result in that case. But did you get any good result with PMN and with other uh, bolt We only tried one type of PMN, which was a fairly large disc uh, with a bolt through the middle. We didn't try discs, and, and that's maybe something right. we should try at some I point. I was because of the PMN. Could be the PMN. Anyway, uh, next one. So, so I'm, I'm still talking about experimental stuff, and I'm not getting to the theory part, so I'm going to rush ahead. Uh, again, little and large. Didn't give you the you were it didn't give us any near the thrust that I, that I wanted, so it, uh, it was uh, not a very good uh, model. So we've got um, not a good device. So some devices simply don't work. I'm just saying in advance. Again, this device here, it turned out I, did, uh, I put this thing on a, a network analyzer, and it basically had no resonances. I mean, literally, there was, it was almost like a flat line. It was a kaput device. What can I tell you? If there's nothing there, we can't use a resonant frequency. So it literally just didn't have any, uh, which is really weird. But uh, I guess maybe it was depoled somehow. I don't know. But uh, again, little and large. We, we've tried different uh, uh, combinations. Uh, again, next. And this is, again, Matt, uh, Jim's uh, Mac effect equation. Next, next, next. All of them. Dot, 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 dot. Uh, this equation here is exactly this equation right here. And what I want to actually show you is that you can derive the mass equation in this form. So I've just gone through the steps for you so you can see it. I'm just going to leave that up there so you can look through it yourself. There's volume, you've got power, you've got uh, uh, rest energy density, you've got energy, and I've just basically made some substitutions. It's pretty transparent. You end up with a simple mass equation at the bottom. I'm going to leave that alone next. Okay. So max principle, um, a body's inertial mass is determined by the universe's mass energy distribution. Next. <laughs> I'm going to flip through some of these. Max principle has been defined in several different ways. And in one book, there's about eight different definitions. And at least four of them apply to general relativity. Again, it's a book by Quantum Gravity by Carlo Rovelli. And uh, again, I'll let you look at the, uh, I can give you the, the reference to that one. You can look those up yourself. So at least four of them are definitely true. Like distant stars could affect the local inertial frame. That's certainly true. Rotational uh, local inertial frame inside the bucket is dragged by the bucket. Certainly true. Uh, there's no absolute motion, only motion relative to something. That's the general, that's the basic idea of general relativity. Yes, David. <laughs> I still haven't got to my equations, no. <laughs> Instead of getting the book, it's easier to get the paper off the archive. There's, there's a paper on archive, that's true. Uh, by, by, I think it's by Ravelli as well. And then the last one. Next one. Okay, uh, very, very briefly, Einstein back in 1912, he mentioned this uh, is distant matter. This was a linear approximation in weak field where the matter here, you drag the, the distant matter, this matter gets dragged along with it. And that's a basic Machian kind of idea. Um, it was weak field. You might think, well, if it's weak field, who cares? Um, Lyndon Bell did the same exact thing, only he suggested using a mass that had a big charge on it as well. And then he introduced a, a small mass here and a small mass there. And notice that they're exactly the same distance away from each other, distance z. And then uh, this, he put this charge inside a, a small massive shell, which also had a charge on it. 
So he wanted this charge, the, the electrostatic attraction um, of this guy to, or, or repulsion of this guy to, from the big Q, so the little Q and the big Q repel each other, and that has to balance the attraction so this thing isn't going anywhere. And by doing that, it's actually a very clever arrangement, you can arrange to have this thing have very strong magnetic, uh, um, gravitational fields and, uh, because you're balancing it. Now the idea is, um, this is going to feel a certain attraction being a distant Z away, this is going to feel a certain attraction, but because this is also an accelerating frame, this uh, uh, gravitational attraction will actually be less. And that is calculated in the paper, and I do have very extensive notes on that paper, and I can show you the derivation, and it is true. You do work it out to be less, and that is a strong field limit, not a weak field limit. Next. Okay, um, think about this Mach effect thruster. I've never liked the word thruster, because nothing is really thrusting. We don't have rocket fuel thrusting out the back or anything like that. I think we should rename it. Uh, maybe we should have a vote on whether we should rename it. Mach effect gravitational assist drive, the mega drive. I thought that was really cool, especially since it's sort of yay big, right? So, but it makes more sense because this thing really is a gravitational assist. Think of the simplest gravitational assist you can. You've got, you've got Jupiter here. You're sending a satellite around Jupiter. This is in the rest frame of, of Jupiter, right? The satellite comes in, it swings around, it goes away. But we all know that even in Jupiter's perspective, it doesn't look like anything much has happened. Um, if you step away from Jupiter in your rocket ship now and you're looking at Jupiter, you know that Jupiter's sort of moving and then this thing comes along and now it's, that Jupiter's tugging on this and it's yanking it out and it gets a, a huge velocity boost, right? So that basically explains where this thrust is, this force is coming from. It's a gravitational assist. My, my Jupiter is the rest of the universe. That's what I'm trying to say. So momentum is completely conserved. What, what the universe drops in momentum, we gain in momentum. It's just that, I mean, from the, the perspective of Jupiter, you don't really see an awful lot going on, right? But, um, and similarly, if you're in the rest frame of the universe, most of general relativity is in the rest frame of the, the smooth fluid, which is the universe, you don't really see anything. But if you take yourself out of that frame, all of a sudden, you are seeing effects that you wouldn't normally see. And that is exactly what Hoyle-Malika does, okay? It, this, is, this is Einstein's gravitation. That's Hoyle-Narlika. They've stepped away from that smooth fluid approximation, that's static. It's an ideal fluid. Ideal means you are in the rest frame of that fluid. So you're not going to see what's happening to these mass fluctuations and, and all that. You have, to, you have to be in the Hoyle-Narlika frame to see it. But literally, it's the same thing. It's, it's a, a matter of point of view, in my, my opinion. And also the way that you can describe... Uh, next slide, please. The way that you can describe... Keep going. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, no, I don't need that one, and again. Uh, this, this one's good. The way that you can describe um, the actual physics of, of the motion, um, Einstein would have a different point of view. So I'm saying, okay, we've got a, a, a mass here, and we've got the rest of the universe way out here. How can the rest of the universe interact with this instantaneously? Now, Einstein would have a very simple answer to that, but I'm going to do the hoyle narlikin method first. They introduce advanced waves. Advanced waves, just like the wheel of Feynman, is, the hoyle narlikin is the wheel of Feynman absorber theory of the gravitational field. That's exactly what it is. So you've got advanced waves, you've got retarded waves. Advanced waves go backwards in time, and they're perfectly legit. Dirac used them to derive the, uh, the relativistic radi radiation reaction. And then uh, Wheeler Feynman came along and tried to give the, the advanced waves a physical meaning by introducing the absorber. Okay, that's what Wheeler Feynman did. Then Paul Davies and Nolika actually did the relativistic version of Wheeler Feynman, the classical theory of Wheeler Feynman, made it relativistic. Okay, and then Nolika went on to do the gravitational version. And why is that, you say? Because actually we, uh, Einstein was present when uh, uh, Feynman gave his talk at Princeton when he introduced the Wheel of Feynman theory. And uh, there was a question asked by Niels Bohr, who said to Einstein, hey, this, this, this theory can't be right. Don't you agree, that Dr. Einstein? And then he, he saw Einstein look looked like he was falling asleep. So he nudged him and said, I, Dr. Einstein, don't you agree? This theory can't be correct. And apparently Einstein said, no, I just think it's going to be hard to do a similar theory for gravity. And that's in that, that nice book, uh, The Autobiography, Beat of a Different Drum. You'll, you'll see it in there. So Einstein certainly knew about this. He just didn't know how to use the advanced and, and retarded wave stuff in, in this way. But Hoyle and Nolika figured out how to do it. And uh, it's totally Machian. They start out with a principle. You've got a, a mass here, interacts with a mass there. So you have to have at least two masses. They're interacting. The, the, the waves in between are literally the space time. That is the space time. Okay, so uh, how would Einstein, if, if you're not using advanced waves, so advanced waves going backwards in time, I'm going to show you an image of that in a second. Um, how else could you think of it? How would Einstein think of it? Well, you probably know Einstein was really good 
at uh, putting himself in different frames of reference, and he had a special liking for putting himself uh, on, on the back of a photon, <laughs> sitting on the photon and riding the photon. Or, okay, so let's uh, click one more time, just one more. Ding. Um, <laughs> be, the, be the photon, sit on the photon, and what do you see? Well, in special relativity, uh, it, it's, we, we know that uh, time sort of dilates infinitely and, and space contracts and, and basically your, your Lorentz contraction, basically everything goes to zero. So you have a, basically a null geodesic, do you not? That geodesic is simply a four-dimensional length, time and space. So if the length is zero, doesn't that mean that you're already there? So we shouldn't call it action at a distance, we should call it action at no distance. The light like particles don't move any distance. They, they're, they're there already, folks. So basically photons are everywhere at every when, okay? So that's how Einstein would have thought of it. So I don't think he would have needed to introduce the advanced waves because he knew that they were already there. But Heidi, doesn't a photon, like if a supernova explodes, we have to wait, you know, for the photon to get there? Uh, it's not everywhere. Isn't it? Uh, oh, again, you if you, if, sure, we, we, our, our perception is that we have to wait. And that's why putting ourselves in a different frame of reference. In reference to the photon, we're there. But in our frame of reference, that's why we need the hoyle nolica thing, the advanced waves, to explain what's going on. But from the, point on view, from the photon point of view, you, you're already there. It's, it's a done deal. And I know Einstein was really good at putting himself in the photon frame. Next. I'm, uh, I'm actually just, not just, so good. Okay, um, um, just uh, be, be, before I lose this point, Lance, uh, look up a quantum eraser. This is an experiment oh. yeah, where you can delete uh, information from a photon from the past. So. Uh, um, Look it up, a quantum eraser that demonstrates this experimentally, that a photon doesn't feel time at all. Yeah, no, I, I get that. And I've actually used, um, thank you for mentioning that, um, uh, because I actually wrote a paper on exactly that thing, uh, the photo, uh, quantum eraser, using advanced waves and showing how the advanced and retarded waves really overlap in space and you can really explain things much simpler using advanced waves actually. It makes far more sense. Uh, there was a joke in there somewhere. There is no distance, there is no time, there is no spoon matrix. That was a very quick reference. Uh, I'm moving on. <laughs> Why can I not do this? I think I'm, I've got electricity in my fingers or something. I'm, I'm, I'm just disruptive. I'm just not going to touch it anymore. So Hoyle-Narlach has, has a book, Action at Distance, Physics and Cosmology. I'm not sure it's going to help too much in understanding their papers. And by the way, there is not one paper. There is like seven or eight papers. Um, next. And um, you might say, where's the proof of advanced waves? Well, I know Partridge back in the 70s tried to do an experiment. Um, I forget exactly what that was about, but uh, I'll, I'll think about it later and someone can ask me later. I know John Kramer also did an experiment. This is by uh, private communication. He did an experiment in the 80s to do with beta rays and trying to point uh, a source of beta, beta particles in a certain direction in the sky. And he was think, thinking that uh, in a certain direction of black holes, they'd be more, more absorbed. And does the, does the power of the radiator change if you point it in a certain direction? So, uh, the, but there were no results. Uh, Partridge's paper is uh, that Nature article there. But there is one little thing that we might say is, is an indicator that uh, there could be something like advanced waves, and that's in the radiation reaction. Um, you, seem, you seem to have this little time where things seem to react before the force actually hits. The time is a very, very small time, 10 to the minus 23 seconds. But even so, um, time shorter than that, you literally can't tell whether things are going forward in time or backward in time. Um, so that's your, your, but unfortunately, I don't think we can measure things that quickly quite yet. Uh, but maybe in the future, there may be a way to actually discover if there are advanced waves or not by looking for that pre-acceleration. Next. Um, now, this is going to be get, getting a little tricky. Which button are you pressing? And I'm going to attempt to press the right one. So with this one, this is advanced waves. This is how they work. Do, 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 do. They go out. Advanced waves come backwards in time. You think it starts there, but it doesn't. They go backward in time. So when's the first time you're going to see it? There. So what's the advanced wave going to do? It's going to do this. So literally, the advanced and retarded waves, they move together like that. That's what's really going on, which is kind of weird, but there you go. Um, now, uh, what I wanted to do before I did uh, the hoyle nolica stuff and produced this equation for you, or something very similar, I wanted to show you something that you'd recognize, the geodesic equation, and look at the hoyle nolica geodesic equation, which has mass variations in it. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to even be able to see this, and I don't want to take too much longer, so I know that Jose has got some very interesting things to look at. Now, that is really small, but this is basically, I try to do it the simplest way I possibly could think of. So there's a, you see an I, which is the, the action, and you see basically a half M V squared, essentially, with a G nu nu stuck in there for good measure. So there's, your, there's energy, and I'm integrating over dS, which you can think of as being a pr proper time. So literally, all I'm doing is writing down an action, 
And now I'm going to use Lagrange's equation of motion and find the geodesic from that. That's all I need to do. So uh, there you have dl dx. There you have dl dx dot, which is basically like velocity. And I put them in the standard Lagrange equation of motion. And when you do that, out pops uh, the usual geodesic. Okay, that's, that's as simple as it gets. You can't really do it much more simpler than that. And that's maybe a little bit non-standard. I say sometimes I do things a little bit non-standard, but uh, you can derive the same exact thing um, by using this kind of uh, approach where you start off with, and that's what I was trying to do on the board here, but I knew I was going to run out of time, and probably you can't even see it because the equations are way too small. But um, you can take a look at that later. That's the usual approach that you'll see in textbook. Well, maybe you'll see that in a textbook, uh, but I would have thought it was a pretty standard approach. Uh, you see up top, you've just simply got the, the, a, a, a basic uh, metric there, uh, differentiate the thing to get the delta ds, where you can think of ds as being a uh, proper time, and then do the variation of it in just a few steps. It doesn't take very long at all. Uh, bear in mind that this term is symmetric in mu and nu, um, and you can write it two different ways. At the bottom, I sort of make it symmetric again here. See this one here? It's mu, lambda, nu. But I could have differentiated him or him, so I get to write them as two, write a half and then write it in two different ways. So I made them, I sort of symmetrize it, if you think, if you think of it that way, just to get the three terms, which is basically the Christoffel symbol. And then, yes, of course, you get back the geodesic equation. Now, using that exact same thing, all you do differently is take the mass, which you don't even see in this equation. I could put a mass in here and then let that vary as well. It's exactly the same procedure. Um, and so, there we go. So I put the mass in there, but I'm letting the mass vary. Uh, now, I did it this way because the hoyle nolica notation is a little bit messy. They use A for position. They use MA for the mass at position A. They use A for proper time. And it's a little bit funky to, to read that. So I try to just use the same sort of thing and just use the mass fluctuate. That's all I'm doing. Okay? Um, Next slide, so you just see the mass fluctuation. See, it takes a little bit longer, but the steps are exactly the same. So there's the, the thing that you integrate by parts. And you, you, I've just said that this bracket term here has to be zero, hence that guy equals this guy, just written that out there. Um, expanded it a little bit. And uh, again, uh, use that symmetry property of writing that out two different ways and pulling in a half term. And after rearranging it, you end up with this beastie. And all I've done is put a, a, a force, a, a, equation like a, a E and M type force on that side. You don't really need to have that there. I just wanted to show you what it would look like. But basically here you see you have a mass and velocity. Here's a mass term and here's an extra term that you don't normally have. So extra terms come in when you allow the mass to change. But in normal relativity, you're always in the rest frame of the mass. So the mass isn't going to change on you because you're in the rest frame, right? V is zero, literally. Uh, is the time there? The, uh, tau, yes, is the proper time, yes. Um, next. So this is uh, a little, it's not this basic, it is this the same as existing physics? Of it is if you allow the mass to change. It's just that uh, they put themselves in the rest frame and, and everything's, uh, not, nothing's moving. Say existing physics is in the rest frame. Let's put it this way. When you think about a gravitational assist and think of the mass of Jupiter, do you literally put in the change in the mass of Jupiter when the satellite goes around? You say it's so small you neglect it. They're always, they're always neglecting these small terms, and it's the small terms that we're using. Okay, so we can't neglect them. We have to keep them. Um, okay, now at this point, I would normally go to my type notes. Not going to do it. I'm running out of time. Next, next slide. Um, the hoyle nolica thing, <laughs> I was going <laughs> to... I wasn't even going to try and derive, because I, I know I don't have the time to do it, but this is basically the hoyle metric, but it's already been simplified. There's a few more terms in there. That's the hoyle metric in a smooth fluid approximation, where you take the matter density of the universe to be spread out smoothly like a, a smooth soup. What's the metric I see? Uh, metric right now, I'm, I'm going to go to flat space time, minus plus, plus, plus. <laughs> So I'm immediately going to go to flat space time so I can get the result and compare it to Jim's because he's always using the flat space time. Now, in order to go to flat space time again, because uh, the, the G is now, I'm going to treat it like it's a, a flat space time, the uh, de derivatives are going to be zero. So that every time you come across a Christoffel symbol, I can put it equal to zero. And that's going to be a huge simplification. Now, you notice I've got, to, you recognize this term here and this term here? Those guys are basically from Einstein's equation. Well, again, I can't derive. It takes me 16 pages in my notes to derive that from eight different papers. You did a Lagrangian to get this thing. I did. What did you do to get that? 
It's actually a very simple Lagrangian. It's in my notes. I'll show you later. Oh, okay. All right, I don't want to do it right now. It's, it's just I don't have the board for it. Do it, but I'm just wondering where it comes from. Uh, it actually comes from a very simple Lagrangian, which looks like a, a Green's function, which is a function between two particles, A and B. And then you sum, for, for particle A, you sum all the possible Bs in the universe. And it literally, that's what it looks like. It's so simple. It's not the Hilbert It is not the standard. No, it is not any of those things, no. So, it's a, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you in a bit, but you literally get back Einstein's equations when you also go to the, the limit of being um, in the rest frame. Right now, we're not in the rest frame. We're in a smooth fluid approximation, but not the rest frame. So anyway, let me, let me continue here just a little bit more. Um, this, the Kappa thing that I'm going to introduce is basically two times three with six over the m squared. So if I bring this thing and divide through by it, you'll get exactly six over m squared on this side of the equation. And that's your usual eight pi g. Now everything Hohenlalika does is c equal to one. If I put it back in, you'd get the c to the four there. So that would be a normal Einstein term. But then of course, all these other terms, I'd have to also divide through by the m squared over two uh, on, on the right hand side as well. So I'm, I've given you a couple of ba very basic definitions here of partial derivatives. The covariant derivative does have the Christoffel symbol, but because I'm in flat space time, I can set that equal to zero. So literally all the covariant derivatives that you see are going to become uh, basic standard uh, uh, partial derivatives. Um, so going ahead and looking at the, just the odd terms, these extra terms, I just want to look at the extra one. So this is an extra term, there's an extra term, and I'm going to divide through by the m squared over two just to make it on an equal footing. So then literally I can write it like this bit, is equal to, uh, this term will become 8 pi g over, over c to the fourth times this. And then what I'm going to say, all the extra terms are like a small change in the energy density tensor. So I'm just going to put that in there just to give you, a, just bump these two terms into an, an extra expression. So there's your extra expression right here. And that basically is, so all this stuff is 2 divided by the m squared of this term and, and this term. So I've just rewritten those two terms, dividing through by m squared over 2. And I get this term and this one. Now remember, um, the m is actually a scalar field. You have to differentiate once to make it a vector, and then the next covariant derivative, I'm going to, go, going to assume it's just a simple derivative, because I'm put the Christoffel symbol equal to zero because of the flat space time. So this is basically a double derivative. Scalar function, second derivative, okay? Again, a second derivative. So what I've done, I've split it into two parts. I want to look at this, the, uh, uh, the, the, the di diagonal, so 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So uh, when I use the 0, 0, I get 2 over m, uh, g, 0, 0, which I take equal to, to minus, and then the 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3 are all plus. So then I'm going to get uh, the 0 term on the first term, and then this term is going to be all plus, plus, plus. Um, and I'm using 0, 0. So that specific one is 0, 0, so it's, uh, it's that term right there. And this thing can be, the mu nu's can be anything. So it can be 0, also 1, 2, and 3. So I've left that in there for now. Over here as well, I'm looking at the zero, zero terms, which is the second derivative with respect to time. And here again, um, I've got zero, zero, which is the minus one, and I've got gamma, gamma. So I've just left it as dm, dg, x, gamma, and again, the same thing, and it's a dot product uh, for that one. And now I'm looking at, um, let's see, so I wrote it out like this for the alpha beta being zero, but the alpha beta can also be one, two, or three. So I've also written it in terms of, uh, that's actually a k symbol, believe it or not. So I've written in terms of k as well. So there's a k squared. Here's a dm dk. And then I left the gammas in. And then the next step, I'm going to show you what happens when I choose the values of 0, 1, 2, 3 for the mu nus. And similarly, um, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3 here as well. So uh, next, next slide. I, um, this is basically the, the last slide I need to show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, OK. So, uh, so the, that little change that we talked about, uh, here I put in new new equal to zero, and that's what you get for that term. Here I put in new new one, two, three, and that was for the zero, the alpha beta being zero term. And here again, um, gamma zero, gamma one, two, three. And you notice that terms are cancelling. I mentioned that this guy cancels with uh, this guy. Uh, is that right? No, this guy cancels with this guy, and, and this one is going to cancel with something down here. I've kind of made them the slants in the same direction so you can see which one's cancelling out. And again, these two cancel with each other. And here are the terms that started out with alpha beta being 1, 2, 3, and now you've got uh, mu nu being 0 and mu nu being 1, 2, 3. So you see how the, the full uh, trace is uh, cancelling bits all together. So you have to use the full trace, the 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. And then you end up with this guy and this guy, which if you put them together, will give you terms that look like um, the, t, the t squared term 
and the x squared term. So I've literally got Jim's expression with the dt squared and dm dt, second derivative and first derivative, but I've also got terms with x and x here as well. So I've got both the time terms, uh, as you see, second derivative with respect to time and space, time and space. So we've kind of thrown the space ones under the rug. And if you've looked at any of my papers, I kind of, um, well, what can I say? I think I was concentrating on the t, and I was thinking maybe I can reinterpret that as a t if I multiply by velocity, and I think I combine them in a strange way. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just left it as it is. I think there really is a t and a c, I don't, a, a, an x and a t. I don't think you can throw them away like that. So I think that's the better way to write it. Okay, and that's really what I want to show you. This comes straight from the field equation of hoyle nalika And if I had another four or five hours, I could derive that hoyle nalika thing for you, but it's, it's very messy. It goes into, it's like 16 pages in my notes, but I'll be very happy to show it to you. And actually, the, looking back at the Einstein Lagrangian, he artificially separates out the, the mass terms from particles from field energy. And, and energy is E equals mc squared, right? Why are those things separate? They shouldn't be separate. Well, now I can put them both together in one energy term. They're not separated anymore. So one part of the Lagrangian is something that dates back till, oh, turn of the century, but before the turn of the century. And it, it, he kept that, rather than trying to combine all the energies into one. And I think that was a, that was a mistake. So using a, 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 what they call it, a Schwarzschild tetrode Fokker Lagrangian, um, starting from there. And it, it, anyway, I'm gonna stop now. And uh, Jose is gonna start from basically this, this idea here. And he's gonna derive for you a, a, a force. He's gonna tell you about the force model and how closely we get to our uh, actual uh, results in the, in the lab. And it's the same as Jim's Yes. Yes, exactly. Again, this, this is exactly from Jim's, Jim's papers and his book. This is what you'll see. Well, you'll see this in the book. I just re-derived it to this. I'm getting exactly the same thing from uh, hoyle nalika from the field equation. And basically, I'm saying the only difference between hoyle nalika and, and Einstein's gravity is that hoyle nalika takes you out of the frame of reference of the, of the smooth fluid. So you're not um, at rest with respect to the fluid. Like, like being at rest with respect to Jupiter and seeing the satellite go around, you're actually looking at at Jupiter and seeing this thing speed up and fly off. So that perspective is very important. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there.